Well, I would like to thank Eugenius uh, for the initiative uh, of this project, and um, of course to Silvan and to Pierre for organizing this conference and uh, in, uh, inviting us also uh, to this conference. Um, my research uh, concentrates mainly on the changes in uh, on the changes in the individual dismissal laws. Uh, made in the last couple of years as a reaction to the crisis in the United States. Um, I tried to identify the major changes made in individual dismissal laws, mainly in those countries which have been hit uh, most worst by the crisis, um, uh, especially in the southern European countries, so Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece. And I made also, made also some references to the Hungarian situation, even if, of course, Hungary has a slightly different uh, situation. Hungary is outside of the Eurozone, um, has a little bit uh, different labor tradition. Um, but even so, and, uh, Hungary has not received any bail out since 2008. <coughs> so Hungary has a different uh, situation. But interestingly, um, the changes made in business law have been very similar to that uh, adopted in the mentioned other uh, southern European states. And uh, the link between my research project and the European labor law is actually the European Commission. Because um, I was interested uh, particularly on those changes which have been introduced uh, at the suggestion of the Troika, so of the IMF, ECB, and the European Commission. I tried to identify this, uh, uh, the, the common changes, the common uh, similar amendments in the legislation of individual dismissal in these countries. And of course, the aim of my research uh, was to try to have uh, find an answer to the question whether these uh, changes uh, were the correct ones, so whether these suggestions correct. Um, um, first of all, um, maybe just some introductory, introductory uh, preliminary remarks. Um, um, I will focus only on <coughs> individual labor law, so I excluded from my research collective business law for the sake of scope and time. And um, um, I'm also fully aware of the fact that, of course, this missile law cannot be considered in isolation in general, but it has a very close inherent connection to labor market policy, to social security, uh, to general social security, to unemployment benefits. However, I think this missile law in itself is so important for labor lawyers that it, it's worth just uh, uh, discussing it in more detail. So I am focusing, I keep in mind this close relation to labor market policies and social security, but I focus on an individual dismissal. And um, it was not really my aim at uh, doing deep research in, in national individual labor laws, but rather to identify the similarities and the similar tendencies. So what I would like to do is uh, here, after I made already my uh, preliminary remarks, I selected four major issues which I would like to discuss with you. And if I still will have any time at the end, um, I would like to evaluate these uh, four changes also from an economic approach and from an fundamental rights approach. But first of all, I would like to um, um, discuss with you or, or uh, present my ideas on these four selected issues. The first of all, uh, the four changes which I selected because I think it's very important is um, the phenomenon that um, we could uh, uh, notice in different member states. Um, and this is uh, the introduction of long probationary periods or long uh, qualifying or waiting periods. Um, these uh, instruments aim at uh, either completely excluding or at least reducing the scope of dismissal law for those uh, having a new employment contract. And I think it's a very strong instrument. It means actually a very strong striking uh, deprivation of, of the uh, protection for those workers. Um, actually, it uh, happened in France already before 
before the crisis in 2005 that the new employment contract has been introduced um, with, uh, with, a, with uh, less Swiss uh, protections. Uh, but um, it was also introduced in Spain and in Greece um, the possibility to conclude a new employment contract with one year probationary period. Um, so I think um, I selected this uh, change as the first one because, uh, in my opinion, this is the strongest change. Um, and uh, of course, we can uh, uh, certainly see this uh, strong tension between uh, the economic uh, approach and fundamental rights approach in this uh, instrument. Uh, because maybe uh, from an economic approach it uh, can be welcome this idea. Some labor economists has already suggested the introduction of some kind of tenure track models, uh, meaning that uh, dismissal protection could be built up gradually by time. Um, uh, but uh, I think from a fundamental rights approach, <coughs> it's rather a burning uh, development. And uh, uh, the ILO committee, uh, uh, the tripartite committee, has already criticized this uh, development and criticized the Spanish uh, situation. And also the uh, expert committee um, said that uh, this one-year probationary period violates Article 4, Paragraph 4 of the revised European Social Charter. So from this side, so from this fundamental rights approach, uh, it's rather a worrying um, uh, development. And um, I, I would agree uh, with uh, this uh, fundamental rights approach because I think it's um, uh, this general exclusion of the protection, it's rather an alien um, phenomenon to the, to the labor law. Even if uh, we can notice that uh, the scope of dismissal protection is not uniform and it hasn't been uniform even before the crisis. But uh, there are some splits, not only based on the length of the employment, but uh, also, for example, based on the size of the employer in many states, in Italy, Portugal, Spain. Um, as far as I know, the dismissal protection um, um, is uh, diverse based on the fact uh, how big the employer is. Um, uh, but I think this uh, instrument uh, leads to the further fragmentation of uh, the labor law protection, so I would welcome this, uh, um, this development. Uh, let's turn to the second change uh, which I selected here for further uh, uh, examination, and this is the interpretation of a valid economic reason for dismissal. Uh, this is rather an exception in, in the four, among the four selected uh, legislative amendments because there have been very small changes regarding uh, the interpretation of the valid economic reason. However, I think uh, uh, this is a very uh, significant determinant uh, for the strictness, uh, for the strength of a national dismissal law. So I think it's maybe a verse uh, saying some words on, on, on this topic. And I think it hasn't been considered appropriately uh, also by, by the OECD indicators or the new, by the new ILO indicators which uh, try to measure the strictness of uh, dismissal protection. So as I mentioned, there have been only um, small changes uh, in the interpretation which reason can serve as a valid economic reason. Uh, in Spain in 2010 and 2012 uh, there were some small changes, but uh, mainly I guess it's a very sensitive issue. Um, and if I speak about economic reason, I understand mainly any objective reasons um, uh, related to the employer, so organizational, structure, technical reasons. And uh, I think here the main question is which circumstance or goal of the employer can serve as an objective economic ground for this mystery. And actually, we have two alternatives to answer this question. The first one, if we say uh, actually the company has to be in a bad economic situation, there must be some kind of drop in turnover. Or the other possibility is to say um, any clear, actual uh, ground uh, which is causal 
um, for with the termination of the employment uh, contract can serve as an economic objective reason. Um, and I uh, call for this broader interpretation of the economic ground. I think um, uh, we cannot accept uh, that the employer make personal decisions only if uh, the company is already in a bad financial situation because it could, would be too late. And I also think that uh, uh, we can't uh, require uh, from the courts, for example, to uh, review whether uh, this decision made by the company was really efficient or uh, they can't review it uh, on uh, adequacy. So I speak here for, for a broader interpretation of the valid economic reason for dismissal. However, I would like uh, to suggest to couple it, to combine it with, uh, the, with the obligatory consideration of certain social circumstances. Um, so I think uh, uh, it would be um, um, a positive um, development to understand this uh, economic reason in a broader term, to give um, a broader uh, room, leeway for the employer to, to make his personal decisions. However, in order to, need to protect those who are really in need of protection, um, uh, the employer should be obliged to take into consideration some social circumstances. Um, and I think that the Austrian model um, is could serve as an example for social circumstances where um, uh, courts usually um, uh, consider two main uh, aspects. Uh, first, uh, the expected length of unemployment. So how long will be unemployed, uh, this person will dismiss, and uh, the expected wage loss. So um, what about uh, the wages in the next new employment? But also, of course, other social circumstances can be and should be taken into consideration, like age, uh, custody for children, and so on. Um, my third change uh, affects uh, the direct cost of dismissal. If I speak about direct cost of dismissal, I understand basically all costs uh, uh, that the employer has to pay either for the employee or in some cases also to some uh, state authorities. Um, we could notice here in this field basically the reduction of uh, notice periods and severance payments in all affected and analyzed countries. Um, regarding this direct cost of dismissals, I, I would like to make uh, two proposals. The first one is actually from Hugh Collins, uh, who wrote an excellent book on dismissal uh, more than 20 years ago. And he mentioned this idea that uh, uh, the legislator should always consider uh, the indirect cost of dismissal. Uh, because uh, if someone will be dismissed, um, their bill, his dismissal will impose a very high indirect cost on the state by the direct uh, replacement of the wage by unemployment benefits usually. Uh, but also uh, there will be some cost in, in the case of uh, long-term uh, unemployment uh, uh, because it's uh, very often accompanied by health problems. And of course also uh, the active policy, labor policy, labor market uh, measures have a very high cost. So uh, for the legislators, it should be very useful um, to counterweight to balance the indirect cost of the state and the direct cost uh, of the employer. And actually, the bottom limit of direct cost should not be below the social cost of the unemployment. So uh, it doesn't make so much sense to reduce the notice periods and severance payments too much because it will just at the same time simultaneously uh, increase the cost for the state. So it doesn't make so much sense, but the cost should be bared by the employer if they are less than the cost of the state at the end. This is the first uh, idea. And the second one is, uh, which I wanted to uh, emphasize here, uh, as uh, the best example, maybe, regarding in this context, is the, the Austrian model of uh, severance payments funds. 
So in Austria in 2008, a new model uh, of severance payments have been introduced, which uh, serves um, actually as an individual um, insurance account. So uh, meaning that the employer has to pay every month a certain amount <coughs> uh, to a designated fund. And um, uh, uh, meaning, and this uh, and it serves like an individual account of, uh, of the employee. Um, and uh, and this model um, um, has several advantages. It serves basically the mobility of the employee between uh, between uh, the employment, and it's also good for the employee because uh, the employee will never lose actually. Uh, uh, the right to get the severance payment, but uh, the employee will get it actually, uh, eventually, um, even if the employee uh, dies, then uh, even if it's, uh, her uh, or his uh, years he uh, inherit this uh, payment. Um, and um, the last change which I would like to analyze here affects the appropriate remedy in case of unfair or wrongful dismissal. Here in this context, I would like to mention three issues. Uh, namely, the reinstatement versus financial compensation, then the interim wages, and the amount of compensation. Uh, first of all, we could notice in the selected countries a uh, clear tendency from, the uh, from reinstatement <coughs> towards financial compensation. So, um, there is this tendency, this shift uh, from reinstatement as normal, usual remedy towards financial compensation. Um, and um, um, I think my idea here is that um, this dual system of remedies, uh, where this reinstatement is only restricted to serious breaches of law, uh, can be uh, correct. If, uh, if there is still an appropriate financial compensation. Um, so, and the worrying tendency is that the amount of financial compensation in case of unfair or wrongful dismissal have been reduced significantly in the last couple of years. And I think uh, this is important to set a limit uh, for this tendency because um, you know, I think it's not allowed that uh, financial compensation, compensation should be an alternative for, for the fair dismissal, you know. Uh, but uh, the amount should be high enough um, to uh, prevent employers um, uh, to use this instrument as an alternative. Um, and um, what we could uh, here notice is uh, was also the cancellation of this uh, so-called interim wages, uh, meaning that the wage uh, paid between uh, the date of giving a dismissal and uh, the date of a financial court decision, uh, which uh, was not only very uh, expensive for the employee, but uh, meant also very high uncertainty in many cases. So these were uh, the four selected issues, um, and I. Um, I'm happy to be able to present uh, uh, them for you, and uh, I still have some interesting idea on uh, on these uh, changes um, from fundamental <coughs> rights approach and economic approach. But if you are interested, in, you can read, of course, in my papers. So I would like to thank you for your attention. <coughs>